Hello and welcome. My name is Raleigh Resnick, and I'd like to welcome you to Medicine and Halacha, a virtual event honoring the legacy of Avi Meiri, my dear father, Rabbi Yaakov Lieber, Rabbi Gamliel Leib. May the words that we hear this evening bring an aliyah to his neshama. In my father's short life on this earth, he merited a notable and distinguished career in the world of medicine and science. But his greatest gift, the greatest merit, was that he served as the personal physician for the Lubavitcher Rebbe for almost two decades. This is a gift that he shared with our entire family. As a result of this connection to the Rebbe, the Rebbe motivated and pushed my father to move forward in his scientific and medical research. He encouraged my mother to inspire audiences around the world in her talks on Yiddishkeit and Judaism. And of course, myself, my brother, and my sister, all of us were molded and formed because of this unique relationship. I'm sitting here before you as a Chabad rabbi representing the Rebbe because of this gift, because of this connection that my family had. I grew up in a household where science and Torah were one and the same. My father, Allah Vashalom, didn't see science and Torah as contradictory. In fact, they complemented each other. If science tells you to compromise your values, your morals, Torah, then it's not real science. And if Torah, if Torah can't be applied in the real world, then it's not real Torah. And so tonight, we're going to hear about the conversions of medicine and halacha. There's a famed tshuva responsa from the Chassam Sofer, Rabbi Moshe Schreiber, a leader, a halachic authority in 18th century Preshburg, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the following responsa was authored by the Chassam Sofer. It's a very well-known responsa. At the time, the Duke of Mecklenburg had issued the following edict. You see, evidently, after people had quote-unquote died and buried, they found out that maybe they weren't fully dead. And they actually buried people. Maybe they appeared to be dead, but they weren't fully dead. And therefore, he said that we cannot bury anybody until three days after their passing to ensure that we don't bury people who have not expired yet. Of course, this presented a problem for the Jewish community. We are enjoined to bury our loved ones right away. It's a biblical prohibition to allow them to be delayed in their burial. And so this became a big issue. And the Chassam Sofer issued the following very well-known responsa. He says, the winds might blow this way and the winds might blow that way. But the words of Torah will forever remain as an anchor, as a foundation, as a tree of life. Maybe there will be times where they'll say that people aren't dead till three days later. Sometimes they'll say, as is unfortunately the case nowadays, that people are dead three days before they expire. But Torah remains eternal. Its truths are eternal. And therefore, we are so fortunate tonight to be able to hear words from two leading experts in this field that will show us, that will teach us, we will come to understand and discover how Torah and science and medicine are indeed all one. And so, I'd like to welcome and introduce our two presenters today, Rav Herschel Schechter is, of course, the well-known Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva University. He is a consultant for the OU for the Orthodox Union. He is a well-known POSIC, issues halachic rulings that are accepted and known throughout. But on a personal note, the Schechter family, Rav Schechter and his wife, have been personal friends of my parents for many, many years. I'd like to personally thank you for all the kindness that you've bestowed to my parents, to my mother, may she be well, to my brother and to my whole family. Thank you. We are also privileged to have with us Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman. Rabbi Reichman is a professor of emergency medicine and professor at the Division of Education and Bioethics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he teaches both medicine and Jewish medical ethics. Rabbi Reichman has prepared a very special presentation on cardiovascular disease. He is known throughout the world as being the expert on the conversions of Torah and medicine. Thank you very much, Rav Schechter. Thank you very much, Rabbi Reichman. Please, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy. What is the Jewish position regarding physician-assisted suicide? We assume suicide is not permissible. It's based on a Apostolic and Chumash and the end of Parshas Noyach. Adam Arishan was told the prohibition of Ritzicha, that one is not allowed to kill, but it had to be repeated after the Mabul, 
because the human beings were on such a so level, such a low level. So um, one might have thought that maybe they long, no longer have sufficient selim alakim that it should be prohibited to kill. So the Torah had to repeat again. There's an iser ritzichi, you're not allowed to kill someone else. And then it says, achaz dimchen anaf shesech medrash. One is not permitted to take his own life either. If the physician is going to assist uh, the patient to commit suicide, he'll be in serious violation. Or if neighbor is he are we always obligated to treat patient who's holding by the end? Do we always extend life? Um, there was a great, uh, great Talmud Chochmah died many years ago. He was a brother-in-law of the Chazanish. He was known as the Stipeler. And after he passed away, they published a collection, the several volumes collection, collected letters that he had written on different topics. Most of them were not on halacha topics. Most were on hashkafe or um, chizuk. So one of the letters, someone asked them about this end-of-life issue. So he writes, when we were young children, the malamdim and the, yeshiv, the teachers and the yeshivas ingrained in our minds that the Jewish position is we always extend life. When we got a little older and we learned Gemara in the Dorim on Daf Mem, there's a long run, and our eyes were opened up, it's not always the case. Then we got a little older and we learned Yeridea. Ooh, so we found out there are even more cases, much more than what it says in the run. We don't always believe in extending life. If it doesn't make any sense, one is not permitted um, to practice euthanasia, mercy killing, active euthanasia, to terminate a person's life because he's suffering a lot. But passive euthanasia sometimes we do permit. So you have to judge in each case whether it's reasonable or not. So the commentaries write in Shulchan Aruch, if you look in the Mogan Avram in Hilcha Shabbos, there's one chapter, Simon Shin Chav Ches, uh, where the Mogan Avram talks about uh, treating uh, patients. So he has a case, let's say a person is 20 years old and he has gangrene in a leg. And the doctors recommend to amputate the leg. And the person says at the age of 20, he'd rather die than live with a plastic leg. And the doctors say, but we've done this hundreds of times, thousands of times. Everything is worked out already. All the things are, are solved. It's ridiculous that, that uh, you'd rather die than uh, live another 100 years with a plastic leg. So the, uh, so the Magar Avram quotes the Radvaz, if the request of the patient is absolutely ridiculous, if you would poll a thousand people, 999 out of a thousand people would say, give me the plastic leg and let me live uh, another, uh, another hundred years. Then you don't listen to the patient's request. You don't honor his request. It's just ridiculous. We would say, butler daite, so that's called bani odem. His choice is absolutely unreasonable. But if it's not such a clear cut uh, situation, uh, Rabbi Yankee Femden and his commentary there on, on the tour uh, that's called Morak Tzia. So the Rabbi Yankee Femden writes in Morak Tzia, if there's a significant percentage of the population, let's say 5% of the population would choose to rather die, they would rather choose to die than to treat the sickness because there's going to be side effects, he's going to lose his hair, he's going to lose his hearing, he's going to, whatever, he won't be able to walk, he won't be able to talk, whatever, and, and it's not such an, un, and he's not 20 years old, he's already 95 years old, and he already lived through a lot of things, and he already has great-grandchildren. So if it's not so unreasonable, and there's a significant percentage of the population who would choose to die rather than to live on such a case, we honor the, the request of the patient. A person is not the balabas. He's not, he has no right to decide uh, that, he want, that he wants to kill himself, but he's a balabas to determine whether you're doing him a favor by extending his life or not. So if the person makes a reasonable choice that a significant percentage of the population would choose, you have to honor his request not to extend his life. We allow that's passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia we never permit, but passive euthanasia we do permit. Uh, Rabbi Shleimer Zalman Auerbach was of the opinion that we distinguish between different types of treatment. Uh, if it's something unusual, an unusual uh, treatment, then the patient has the right to turn it down. He doesn't want to have it. But if it's a standard procedure like giving uh, intravenous 
or um, or, or uh, putting medication into the intravenous, something like that. It's not something away out of the ordinary. So then his opinion was that you're always obligated and the patient has no right to turn it down. But not everyone agrees with Reb Shlom Zalman Oyebach. His son-in-law didn't agree with him. Reb Zalman Nechaniel Goldberg, who was also a big Pesach in Eretz Yisrael, didn't agree. He didn't distinguish between uh, the different forms of treatment. The person, patient has a right to say if, it's a, if it represents a reasonable position that 5% of the population would choose to, to die rather than to live on with these circumstances, then the patient has a right to turn down all, all of the um, treatments, even if it's a standard procedure. Or uh, in the Shulchan Ach, they have a strange case. A person is on his deathbed, and, and they would put the keys to the Beis Knesset, the keys to the shul, under his pillow as his gula that he should live on. So, and the patient would rather die. He reached a certain point in, in his sickness that he'd rather die because he's suffering a lot. So it says in the Shulchan Aruch, you're permitted to take the keys from under the pillow because you're causing him, you're not, he's going to die right away. Somehow they assumed having the keys under the pillow will extend his life. And if you take the keys away, he's going to die. But he's dying from the sickness. He's not dying because there are no keys. The key, if you have the keys under the pillow, this will extend his life somehow. Take away the keys. Not going to die from the lack of the keys. Going to die because he was an old sick man. Uh, so some rabbanim in America years ago thought incorrectly that if you turn off the respirator, you're not touching the patient. You're pushing a button on a machine that's next to the bed. So they thought, that you, or let's say, you pull out the plug on 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 the machine. So uh, the respirator is not working anymore. So some rabbanim thought mistakenly since you're not touching the patient. That's like uh, stopping the blacksmith from making noise. You're not handling the patient. So Moshe Feinstein wrote uh, 75 years ago that that's not correct. If you pull out the plug, then the patient dies from lack of oxygen. Or if you're going to stop the intravenous, it's going to die because of lack of nutrition. If the intravenous bag is all emptied out, maybe you're not obligated to replace it, okay? But they're not allowed to withdraw the, the intravenous. If he's hooked up to intravenous, leave it the way it is. If, you would, if, you'll, if you'll take off the intravenous bag, that's active euthanasia that you're not permitted to do. But if it, if it empties out, you don't have to replace it. Or well, years ago, uh, many hospitals still have it now today also. They have a, a respirator that only works for a certain amount of time, or they have um, oxygen tanks. They used to have oxygen tanks that got used up, then you have to replace it with another oxygen tank. So the most of the hospitals in the big cities, it doesn't go like that anymore. The oxygen keeps on going caseta. But if in the old in the old system, once an oxygen tank is used up and it's Nebuchadnezzar Rahman is on the patient, he would rather die. So you're not obligated to replace the oxygen tank. The way it's usually is, according to Abshleim Zalman Oybach, you're always obligated to give oxygen and uh, hydration and, uh, and intravenous. But uh, many others feel that uh, everything, B'Shevi al all forms of passive euthanasia are permissible. What is the halachic position on abortion? There are three different opinions. If you look in the uh, classical poskim, you look in the Stechemet, which is an encyclopedia that was written over 100 years ago. So he quotes the three opinions. Some are of the opinion that it's permissible. Some are of the opinion abortion is prohibited, midirabona, rabbinically prohibited. And the accepted opinion is that it's a biblical prohibition. That's the accepted opinion. Uh, but the big question is, how serious a prohibition is it? Is it a prohibition? Like one is not allowed to cut off his finger. So if a woman is pregnant with a, with a fetus, so she's not allowed to cut out, it's like cutting a finger off from your hand. You're not allowed to cut out the, the fetus from her womb. Is it a prohibition of mutilating the body? Or is it a prohibition of ritzicha, that you're killing, you're killing the baby? Is it, is it a prohibition of murder? So that's a big uh, question. The difference would be, the Talmud tells us that sometimes we do permit the Mishnah, the Talmud quotes the Mishnah and Aholus, sometimes we do permit um, whenever the mother's life is in danger, then we do permit uh, abortion in order to save the mother's life. 
So the Rambam writes that the reason why it's permissible is because the fetus has the status of a roidev. If one person is chasing after someone else to kill him, so then you're permitted to kill the roidev, the one who's trying to kill the other one, in order to save the nirdev, in order to save the life of the other one. So the Rambam writes it's a problematic Rambam. It seems to be against the Gemara, but uh, the commentaries explain how it's not against the Gemara. So the Rambam's position seems to be it's only permissible to abort the child when the, when the mother's life is, is in danger. She's in danger of losing her life. Anything less than that, it wouldn't be permissible. Rashi, on the other hand, doesn't seem to learn like that. Rashi seems to assume that until a baby is born, there is no prohibition of ritzicha. It's not considered murder. It's only considered chavola, mutilating the mother's body. And uh, let's say if a person has uh, a person has, let's say, six fingers, and they want to cut off one finger in order to look normal like everybody else, we would assume that's permissible. That's not chavola. That's not mutilating the body. The person wants to look normal. The person has two noses. They want to cut off one nose to look normal like everybody else. That's permissible. But even if it's not uh, like that, let's say a person has five fingers, and one finger is giving trouble, a lot of pain, and if you'll, if you'll mutilate the body, you'll cut off that finger, the person will be a balmum, he'll be missing a finger for the rest of his life, but he won't have the pain that he has constantly, so we would permit that. That's chavolo, that's tikan aguf. If you mutilate the body in order to save one pain, an aggravation, and so on, that is also permissible. That's not a prohibition of Chavala. So according to Rashi, it would appear that whenever going through with the pregnancy would cause aggravation to the woman to the extent that she's prepared to, to abort the child in order not to have this uh, aggravation. Let's say it's going to be a sick child and they're going to have aggravation for years and years from this child. So according to Rashi, it would appear that it is permissible. According to the Ramam, it would only be permissible if he's saving the life of the mother. So there is a famous, there are two chubis in the Sefer Torah's Chesed, written by a prominent rabbi. He was the rabbi in Europe, in Lublin. And uh, the practice in those days was that uh, many rabbis who from Europe, when they would retire from the rabbinate, they would move to Eretz Yisrael, and uh, Ashkenazi rabbis, and they would join the Badats, they would join the Bezin and Yerushalayim for the Ashkenazim. The Sephardim were there for, for uh, all along. There was Sephardim were there in the early 1800s. The Ashkenazim started to move to Eretz Yisrael. So they needed their own bezin to give a psak for the Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim and Sephardim don't always follow the same uh, halachic uh, positions. So this uh, rabbi who wrote the Sefer Torah Ches had moved to Eretz Yisrael. And at the end of his life, he was a member of the Badats of, of the Ashkenazi community in Eretz Yisrael. So he has two essays, two chubis and his volume on Ebenezer, where he explains that even according to the Ramam, it could well be that uh, we assume that performing an abortion is a violation of murder. It's only permissible when the mother's life is in danger because we declare that the, the fetus, the, the uber, uh, is a, considered like a roidev. Maybe the Ramam only says that in the case where she's already in Yoshva ala Mashber, she's already in labor. But before she's in labor, maybe the Raman would agree to ra- with Rashi that it's only a, it's only a prohibition of chavala, and let's say Ochtik and Aguf would be mutter to do chavala in order to spare herself aggravation if it's going to be a sick child or something like that. Or it could be that the Raman only maybe not only the, the Ram happens to be talking about a case. The Raman is quoting the Mishnah talking about the case of Yoshua Lamashbe when the woman is already in labor. Or it could even be that the Rambam would disagree with Rashi after the beginning of the ninth month. That's called kololo chadoshov, a full-term pregnancy. Full-term pregnancy in the days of the Gemara meant nine full months. Today in Shulchan Aruch, the Ramah says that uh, you need the beginning of the ninth month. The, Rajbo, the, the Ramah quotes the Tshuvas HaTashbeitz. Tashbeitz lived in uh, Algeria. Um, in the early period, the late Rishonim, early Achreinim, and they said the Rivosh, so he, he writes that today we don't follow what the Gemara said. Today, full-time pregnancy, it's normal to have the baby once she enter, once the pregnant woman enters into the beginning of the ninth month. So maybe the Rambam only feels that it's a prohibition of murder, it's with Sikha, if it's already a full-term pregnancy, and if the baby would be born now, it would be viable without the use of an incubator. 
But if it's uh, not a full-term pregnancy yet, she's not yet into the, she didn't yet enter the ninth month, and the baby will not be able, if, it, if she'll give birth now, the baby will not be viable unless you put it in an incubator. So then maybe the Ramam would, ag- maybe the Ramam would agree with Rashi in such a case, that it's not a Nisar Ritzicha, that's only a Nisar Chavola, it's only mutilating the body of the mother. And if, if uh, performing the abortion will save her years of aggravation, that it would be permissible. The, many follow that opinion. Moshe Feinstein is very machmer. Moshe Feinstein is of the opinion that even to perform an abortion within, within the first 40 days of pregnancy, one has to be machmer like the Rambam, that it's a prohibition of ritzicha, of murder, and it's only permissible when you're going to save the life of the mother. In fact, Rav Moshe Feinstein thinks, that, according to the Rambam, it's only permissible to kill the fetus to perform the abortion, if it's kar of levada, it's almost certain that this will save the mother's life. If it's a, a suffolk, it's not clear. So you have no right to kill someone who's a suffolk roidev. You only have a right to kill the, the roidev, the one who's putting my life in danger. You only have a right to kill him if it's a vada roidev, a kar of levada, a very big chumrah. Uh, the Tavaris Yisrael is a commentary on Mishnayas. So the Tavaris on his commentary on Mishnayas Aholos, on that Mishnah where it says that you're permitted and obligated to perform the abortion to save the life of the mother, he says, Adava Pashut, he says uh, very clearly uh, that even if it's uh, doubtful, he doesn't say, he doesn't agree with Rav Moshe Feinstein, he doesn't get into the dispute between Rashi and the Rambam, but he writes a Dover Pashut that, uh, that even if it's only a suffix, whether the woman will lose her life, one should perform the abortion. Yeah, these shadows come up all the time. woman is pregnant and it's a uh, suffix, whether the pregnancy might, may cause her to lose her life. Anyway, sir, Moshe Feinstein is even machmer. He, he doesn't permit it even within the first 40 days. Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, thought within the first 40 days, the Gemara says that uh, the fetus is considered Maya Alma. It's not considered um, an uber. Let's say a woman, a woman uh, has a miscarriage and she was already pregnant a few months. So she has a miscarriage. So the din is, she has, she has the din of Tumas Yoledes and she has to bring the korban to the Beis Amigdosh. And she has to go to mikveh because of her lettuce, even if there wouldn't be dam. There's a bucket full of dam, but even if there wouldn't be any dam, she would have the dinner of tumas her lettuce and bring the carbonus. But if she only had a pregnancy of less than 40 days, or a little more than 40, 43, 44 days, something over there, when you go visit the pediatrician's office, sometimes they have a book with uh, photographs of the, uh, diagrams of what the fetus looks like at different stages. So when the fetus is already 43, 44 days, I think the whole fetus is only an inch by an inch, but it already looks like a gingerbread man. It looks like a little, you can see the tzuras avlad. So that's what the Gemara says. Before 40 days, there's no tzuras avlad. You can't, it doesn't even look like a, like a human figure in tiny miniature, an inch by an inch. After 43, 44 days, so that's when it begins to have a tzuras avlad. The Rav Soveitchik was of the opinion that since the fetus in the first 40 days or so, doesn't have a tzuras havla, that for sure is only a prohibition of chavola, that's not a prohibition of ritzicha. But Moshe Feinstein is machman nonetheless. He thinks that it's only permissible to perform the abortion even within the first 40 days, uh, when the mother's life is almost vadai in danger, and by performing the abortion, it's kar of la vadai that will be saving the mother's life. Sometimes the doctors will assess the situation and they feel that if the woman will go through with the pregnancy and have the baby, this may affect her mentally. If one follows the Torah's Chesed's position that before labor or before the beginning of the ninth month, usually you can de- the doctors will assess the situation before the ninth month begins. Uh, so then we would, whenever it's in the best interest of the good health of the mother, we would allow the abortion in such a situation. Many would be lenient to follow um, to follow that uh, psak of the Torah's Chesed, but even if um, even if not, um, it in general there's an issue how serious do we consider mental health. 
So if if there's a concern that a person uh, is meshuga, is not all there to the extent that he may drown in the river, he may fall out the window and he may commit suicide, he may not realize what he's doing, he may lose his life. So that's a suffix sakon. So that itself is uh, considered bikoch nefesh. But uh, Ramosha Feinstein was of the opinion that uh, mental, based on a comment that appears in Pirish Rashi, Rashi's commentary on Gemara Tainus. The problem is that we know that Rashi's commentary on Tainus was not written by Rashi, it's written by someone else. So we don't know how reliable it is. So Rashi, in the commentary on Tainus that's called Rashi, it says that one who has a mental problem is considered a suffix, Sarkonis Nefoshes, he permitted to violate Shabbos to save his life, because otherwise he may fall into the river and drown without realizing it. Anything less than that, the Pirish and Rashi seems to hold that it's not called the Pikoch Nefesh. And Moshe Feinstein follows that opinion. Rab Soloveitchik had a tradition from his grandfather, Rab Chaim Soloveitchik, that if a person will be a shaita, a person will, will not be all there. A person has a mental condition and he's not normal, so just to bring him back to normalcy is considered pikoch nefesh, even if there's no concern of his losing his life. The Pasuk says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu breathed into Adam Arishan, Vayipak biapav nishmas chayim, hayiho adam lenefesh chayyo. So the Targum Unkel is, Rab Chaim Alojana points out in his Seif and Nefesh Chaim, that the Targum Unkel is on the Pasuk says, Liruach memalolo. Ruach memalolo means a person a person is a human being, a person is alive as a human being if he has coherent speech, if he can speak coherently about something. If the person is so tzedreit and so tzemisht, he's crazy, he doesn't know what he's talking about, that's, uh, that's already bikoch nefesh to bring him back to, to normalcy. In the Shulchan Aruch it says we have a mister, we have a minig, we have a custom, we don't eat flesh in the nine days. So Rabbi Kivega writes, but if a person had a mental condition, and uh, he's in the process of getting better, coming back to normalcy, uh, we would permit him, he's a choyla. So a choyla is permitted to have, uh, a person is not well, a person is sick, is permitted to have fleshics in the nine days. Even a woman who's losing blood, losing a lot of blood, and she's weak, also permitted to have fleshics in the nine days because uh, she's considered a choyla. But Rab Salvechik said, in the name of his grandfather, Rab Chaim Salvechik, not only would one be permitted to eat fleshiks in the nine days, one would be permitted to eat on Yom Kippur. One would be permitted to eat on Tisha B'Av and on Yom Kippur if he's a shaita and eating, the f- eating whatever food he's going to eat. Uh, eating on Yom Kippur is a violation of an Isa Kores. It's a serious prohibition. But if it's in order, the person's eating food in order to be, because right now he's a shaita, He's, uh, he's deranged, and by eating food, a special diet, he'll get back to normalcy. That itself is considered pikoch nefesh, even if there's no concern that he may lose his life. There's a fellow who used to participate in my weekly shear, who called me up on the phone that he has a family issue. He'd like to come with his wife to discuss something. So they came to my home, and they had two daughters, and the both daughters had some slight learning disability and it took a while till they became mainstreamed and at that time the oldest daughter was already married by now uh, now it's uh, 25 years later so even the younger daughter is married they're both married and the mother and the wife's mother had a nervous breakdown when when she gave birth to the wife and the wife was high strung and the wife was already over 40, and there was a concern that it could, if she'll have another baby, they could only have children with, uh, with a doctor's assistance. Without the doctor's assistance, they, could, they can't have any children. So they wanted, the wife wanted to have another baby to name after her father. She had two daughters. She wanted to have another baby to name after the father, but there was a concern she may have a nervous breakdown, uh, because the mother had a nervous breakdown when she was born, and it may be a sick child because she's ready over for well over 40. So uh, what did I think? So I remember I told them, 
it's not, maybe it's not fair that I should say this because I have nine babies, nine children, and we never had any problems with any of the pregnancies. But I said, if I were you, I would leave everything the way it is. Thank God that you have two healthy children and leave everything the way it is. Why do you have to look for trouble? So they thanked me and they went home. Next week, the husband called me on the phone. He wanted to know, was that a psak or was that an eitzatayva? So I said, it was an eitzatayva, it was a recommendation. Then a couple of months go by, so they called me on the phone. They decided to have another baby. The wife wanted very much to have a baby boy to name after her father. So they went to the doctor and he helped her become pregnant from the husband. And, uh, and then um, the mother used to teach in a day school in the New York area. And she was, she was so nervous about the pregnancy, she went to the roof and she, of the school. She attempted to commit suicide. And the teachers had to hold her down that you shouldn't, she shouldn't uh, commit suicide. So the husband was asking, can they perform an abortion in order to save the life, the life of his wife because she, she's falling to pieces? So I said, under such circumstance, you have no choice. You have to perform the abortion. So when they did the abortion, then the wife went into a deep depression Why she performed the abortion. Then when, they pulled, when she pulled out of that, so they had charata, they felt bad, why they didn't listen to my recommendation in the first place. Yeah, sometimes it's best uh, not to look for trouble. As the law in America stands now, unless the Supreme Court will change it, they assume that each woman who's pregnant has the right to choose to terminate the pregnancy. This is not right. This is not permissible. We assume that it's a biblical prohibition to, to cause an abortion. There are a few exceptions to the rule. But the rule is that it's not permissible. In recent years, there's a lot of talk about the Koyan gene. Um, some were of the opinion, some people are not such experts in, in this area of, uh, of medicine, thought that they came up with a Koyan gene, and we can identify, if a lot of people, we're not sure whether they're Koyan, Malavim, or Yisraelim, so if they have this specific gene, uh, it could be that we should identify the person as a Koyan based on the gene. So others think that the, that the research was not done properly, and it should be done over again. It wasn't done by experts. It was too much, uh, it was too sloppy, and uh, they have to do all the research over again. If they'll come up with enough research to uh, uh, identify that a person with such a gene is Jewish, a person with such a gene is a Koyan, and such, such a gene is a Levi, so then uh, even if it's only 98%, but if you have a Rav, if you have a likelihood of probability, that's enough to establish that a person is Jewish, a Koyan, or a Levi, the Gemara, there's a Mishnah uh, quoted in the Gemara, the end of the first parak in Ksubis, where the Mishnah says, if someone left a little baby on the steps to the police station, and you don't know who the parents of the baby, you don't know whether the child is Jewish or not Jewish. So if the majority of the women in that city, between the age of uh, 12 and, and uh, 50, whatever, the years that a woman is able to have uh, babies. If the majority of the women are Jewish, so then you assume the baby is Jewish. If the majority of the women are non-Jewish, so you assume the babies are non jew You follow the likelihood, the probability. You follow the right to establish whether one is Jewish or not. So the same, to establish whether one is a coin or a levy or so on, um, if there would be such a strong likelihood, we would follow the right, yes. Recently, there's discussion about uh, using the heart of a pig to transplant into human beings. We assume pigs are mutter bahano. Pig is, one is permitted to gain benefit from a pig. It's only osa bachiri, not allowed to eat it, but it's mutter bahano. So that's not a problem. It's mutter bahano, so it's okay. One, uh, one can use it for transplant purposes. Even if pig were also bahano, 
if it's going to ex- if there's a possibility that it's going to extend a person's life for a couple of minutes or for a couple of days, that's called pikuach nefesh. So that you're allowed, to, you're permitted to be mechal shabbos to extend someone's life. Not only if you're going to extend his life significantly, chayyolam chayyolam means for another twelve months, even only chayyusha, even for less than twelve months, even just to extend one's life, you're permitted to be mechal shabbos just to extend the life for another couple of hours. Uh, years ago, in the days of the Rishonim, one of the very prominent Rishonim was the Ravid. The Ravid wrote a separate sefer on the laws of Taras HaMishpacha and Mikvoas. It's called Bali HaNefesh. So the introduction to the sefer, usually in yeshivas, the students don't read introductions. So in the introduction to the Ravid sefer, he poses a question. When God created Adam Arishan, and then he wanted to create Chava, why did he take a rib, or apart from Adam's body, why didn't he create Adam and Chava separately? So he writes, interestingly, that the human body has a tendency to reject the foreign matter. That's what the world of medicine realized when they started making organ transplants from one person to the other. So they realized there's a problem of rejection until they figured out how to prevent the rejection. So the human body has a problem of rejection, and God wanted there should be an institution of marriage the husband and the wife should remain married together. And if he would have created Adam and Chava separately, each one would reject the other one's body. They wouldn't be able to blend together. So that's why he had to create Chava from Adam. So it's not a foreign matter. It's, uh, it's from the same body. I remember many years ago, there was a couple who had fertility problems for many years. They were, they were married for many years, I think over 20 years. And they finally went to Seattle, and they had, uh, with the assistance of a doctor there, so they had a, a baby. So 13 years later, that baby boy was bar mitzvah. So the parents were so excited. We were a little friendly with the parents. They weren't that friendly. They invited everybody and your uncle to come to there. Uh, it was out of town for us. So we went to the, to the bar mitzvah of the boy. So each meal, Friday night and Shabbos morning and Shalashud, each meal, everybody sat at a different table. So one of the meals, we were sitting at the same table with the Jewish doctor from Seattle who helped this couple have the baby. So in conversation at the table, he mentioned that the human body has the uh, tendency to reject foreign matter. And we don't understand, he said at that time, this was uh, 15 years ago, at least 15, 20 years ago. He said, we don't fully understand why the female body doesn't reject the sperm of her own husband. But once in a while, we had a case here in the neighborhood that the wife was allergic to the husband's sperm. And she kept on rejecting it, so they could never have any children together. But that, that's what the Ravid writes. The Ravid interprets that that's Pshat and Beresh, that HaKadosh Boch had to create Chava from Adam because he wanted that the, the male and the female shouldn't reject each other. There is a discussion in Poskim regarding cosmetic surgery. We know one is not permitted to mutilate the body and not permitted to cause bleeding. And when you're going to do surgery, you're going to cause bleeding. So is that permissible? Uh, to do cosmetic surgery. So years ago in the yeshiva, they used to say it's Machlekes Rabbi Soloveitchik and Rabbi Soloveitchik, the two brothers, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, who used to live in Chicago for the last years of his life, he used to say that it's not permissible. And Rabbi Yosef Dave Soloveitchik, who used to live in Boston for many years, he thought that it is permissible. Uh, there is a s- collection of chuvas by the Minchas Yitzchak, Diane Weiss from the Eid Haredes from Yerushalayim. He used to be in Manchester in England. From He was first in Hungary before the war, then in Manchester. And then he was the um, head of the Besden of the Badats of the Eid Haredes. He has many volumes of chuvas. So usually in his chuvas, he quotes everybody under the sun who has anything to say on the topic, and he gives you what he feels his position is. So he has a very, very short chuva on cosmetic surgery, no discussion. He says, Heta Gomer. He says, There are two. There's a, there's a variant of the text in the Rambam when the Rambam writes that it's prohibited to mutilate the body. So there are two readings in the Rambam. He says, One is not permitted to mutilate the bodily, uh, usually of someone else. Derech 
Nitzayon. Nitzayon means I'm fighting with the other person. Ki noshim. And the other reason in the Ramam is derech bizayon. Because I want to be mevazahim. I want to make him look disgusting. But uh, if the person wants to have the cosmetic surgery, that he wants to look better, it's not bizayon, it's not nitzayon, and it's permissible, yours truly, and he signs off, he doesn't feel it necessary to quote anything else. One paragraph, tshuva, which I, I don't think there are too many more tshuvas in the, in the Minchas Yitzchak, where there's only one paragraph. He feels that it's so obvious that it's permissible. The whole prohibition only is if you're mutilating the body, but if you want to improve one's looks, so then we assume that it's permissible. In the days of the Tanoim, there was a big dispute. How do we establish the status of a child where, the, where there was a mixed marriage, where one parent was Jewish, one parent was not Jewish? So there's one opinion that in order to be Jewish, you require both the father. You have to have a father and a mother. Both parents have to be Jewish. There was one opinion, if either the father or the mother is Jewish, the child will be Jewish. That opinion was outvoted 2,000 years ago, and the reform and the conservative just woke up uh, 50 years ago. They uh, reinstituted that opinion. And then the third opinion is that it all depends on, on the mother. The most logical opinion should have been that it should depend on the father, because when you have a mixed marriage and both parents are Jewish, we determine the status of the child, whether the child is a Kohen or a Levi or Israel, based on the status of the father. That's based on the Pasik in the beginning of Chumash Bamidba and Bishbachoisam Lavesa Vaisam. So that's, a, that's an interesting point, but uh, there never was such an opinion. There should have been the most logical opinion. It should all depend whether the child is Jewish or not, it should depend on the father. That should have been the most logical, but that was never considered. The three opinions that appear in the Gemara is you have to have both parents to be Jewish, either one or the other is Jewish, and the third opinion is the accepted opinion, accepted in the Mishnah. Mishnah only quotes the third opinion. The others appear in the Gemara. And the accepted opinion depends on the mother. So that's the question, how do you determine motherhood? Uh, who is considered the mother of the baby? Is it the woman whose egg was used? Or do we say, no, the woman who's carrying the baby for the last uh, nine months is considered the mother. So this is a big dispute, and really n neither position have uh, concrete proofs from the, from the Gemara. So we usually assume that it's a real sveka dina, and we treat it like a suffix. So if you'll have a Jewish woman, we'll, um, we have friends. Uh, with a, a young couple. The mother, the, the wife, is a fertility doctor, and she can't carry her own babies. So uh, when, she wa when she wanted to have a baby, so her husband donated the sperm, and she gave the egg, and, uh, and they had a non-Jewish woman um, carry the baby for nine months. Then when the baby was born, even though the g genetically the father and the mother are both Jewish, but because the woman who was carrying the baby for nine months was not Jewish, so misophic, they had to do uh, a gerus on the baby. The father and the mother are both religious people. So the Gemara says that whenever a religious pair of, uh, a religious couple wants to adopt a baby, we can convert the child, based on the principle of Zohan Adam Shlevifan. We assume we're doing the child a favor by making him Jewish. If the parents are not going to raise him as, a, as an observant Jew, we're not so convinced that we're doing the child a favor. Maybe he would uh, do better by remaining as a non-Jew. If he's Jewish and is obligated to keep kosher, to keep Shabbos, and the laws of uh, Taras HaMishpacha, and, and the parents are not going to give him a Jewish education, then we're doing him a disservice by converting him and making him Jewish. That's not Zohan Adam Shalai Bifan. We have no right to convert a person uh, against his wishes. Or he, he, it's not against his wishes, but you don't know if you're doing him a favor or not. You're probably doing him a disservice. But here the parents were both religious, so they converted the child. So that Misafik, if a girl was converted, uh, even though she was, they had a girl, uh, if the girl is converted even at a very young age, she's not permitted to marry a Kohen later on. So they'll have to tell uh, the daughter that she can't marry a Kohen. 
Kohen is not permitted to marry a Giyoris. In recent years, there was a big uh, issue came up regarding how does one determine the moment of death? When is a person considered dead that you no longer have to treat him and you should bury him? Kovatik Barana Bayamu, you should try to bury him on the same day before the sun sets, before the Shkia. There are many different opinions. I remember once a doctor showed me a chart in one of the medical journals uh, where there was a there were around 15 different shittas. Each shitta had three variations. So, th- so there were 35 shittas. Th- there were uh, 45 shittas. If you take 15 shittas with three variations. And um, the British Royal Academy of Medicine and the uh, Harvard criteria and, and, the, and the American government and the Chinese government and the Japanese government, every country has a different shitta. Uh, when is it considered death? So some Rabbani came up with this uh, newfangled idea that since the stem of the brain controls uh, the functioning of the body, controls the breathing, and the Gemara says, based on a posik in Parshas Noyach, when the Mabal occurred, so it says, Kol All the human beings who were able to breathe before drowned, because when there's so much water, so you drown. So, the, so they, under, they understood or misunderstood. They understood that Gemara meant to say that breathing is a definition of being alive, and one is not breathing is not alive. Uh, and since the stem of the brain controls the breathing, so whenever there's brain death, whenever the stem of the brain is dead and it's not able, the person not able to breathe on his own, he needs a ventilator. So uh, then he's not considered alive, right? So, the, so you don't have to extend life anymore. If he's not able to breathe independently, he's not alive. So the Pashtu says that the whole thing is a mistake. Um, the Chassam Seifer was a very prominent rabbi in the early 1800s. And the Chassam Seifer has many, many tshuvas. Uh, written to different people, and at the beginning of every tshuva, every responsa, he says to whom he's writing. And there are less than 10 tshuvas where he doesn't write whom he's writing to. One of the few tshuvas where he doesn't write is on, on this issue, on, on determining the moment of death. And we know the tshuva was sent to the Maritz Chaya. So to hear Chaya, so it was the rabbi in Zalkava. Zalkava is a city in Galicia. Um, the government now in Europe, there, there's still countries like that, the government uh, instituted a law at that time that you're not permitted to bury anyone who died until 72 hours go by since he died to make sure that you're not burying a living person because every once in a long while they would judge incorrectly and they would be burying a person who, who looks like he's dead but he wasn't really dead. So they made such a law in several of the countries in, in Europe. They still have the laws. You're not allowed to bury the person until three days go by. So Maritz Chayis, Rabbi Zalkova, sent a letter to the Chassam Sefer. Maybe we should go along with the government laws because the Gemara tells stories like that, that someone went to the cemetery uh, to visit um, in the cemetery and he heard one person who was buried already before was banging on the doors, let me out of here. They buried me by mistake, I'm still alive. So they saved his life. And the Gemara says, uh, we're not so sure how to, how to determine the moment of death. So he raised the possibility we should go along with the government laws. So the Chassam Seifer has a very sharp comment. The reason why they didn't write who the tshuva, they left out the first line, who the tshuva was written to, because it's a very... Um, it's a strong attack against Maritz Chayis. So he says, are you an Apikoiris? Some survey writes, are you an Apikoiris? You don't believe when the Rabbani Shalom gave the law to Moshe Rabbeinu to bury everybody the same day, he told them how to determine when the person is dead. He said, if the Chavri Kaddisha waits 15, 20 minutes and the person is not breathing, we assume that he's dead. But that's not, he writes, that's the Maritz Chayis raised the point that the Rambam in the Mar Nevuchim quotes from Galen. Galen, I think, was a Greek uh, doctor, either a Roman or a Greek doctor. And Galen writes that there was a situation where a person stopped breathing for three days, 
And after three days he came to and he continued to live normally. So if it's possible for a person, and the Ramam quotes this from uh, medical records, so if it's possible for a person to survive not breathing for three days, so how can you bury a person who's just not breathing for 15 minutes? So the Chsam Sefer, it's interesting, the, the, when the Chsam Sefer's chubas were printed, I think after the death of the Chsam Sefer, they didn't want to insult the Maritz Chai, so they took out his name. But the Maritz Chai is published several swarim, and one of the swarim is my correspondence with the Chsam Sefer. So he's very proud of the fact that he corresponded with him, and he has the letter that he sent to the Chsam Sefer and the letter that the Chsam Sefer responded. And you understand the Chsam Sefer's letter better now because it corresponds paragraph by paragraph to what the Maritz Chais wrote him. So in the paragraph that the Maritz Chais raised the issue of the Mor Nebuchim, that he says, Galen records that a person stopped breathing for three days and, and uh, he came to afterwards. So the Chsam Sefer responds to that. So he says, breathing is not the definition of life and death. That's a similar dover. That's a way to determine that he's dead. That's not the definition of life and death. And the Gemara commented on the Pasik in Parshas Noach by the Mabel, Kolashanishmas Rochaim Biapov, Kolashabacharov and Mesu. That's an Asmachta. He said, that's not the real, that's not the definition. And the Maritzchais and the, and the Chasam Seif and the same Tshuva also writes, a lot of people today say that that's Apikurses, but uh, some say it wasn't an Apikurses, in my opinion. He writes, the rabbis were not uh, uh, doctors. They didn't go to medical school. They didn't have traditions from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. All of the medical information they picked up from the Goyesha doctors. A lot of times there are mistakes in the Gemara about medicine. The Gemara in Gittin has a whole a few pages about medical issues. And the Goenim already say, whoever follows the Gemara and, and you're going to get sick and die, it's your own stupid fault because you shouldn't follow the medicine of the Gemara in every generation. Medicine is always developed over the years by uh, trial and error. A lot of error, a lot of trial and error. So the whole story of, the, of assur- assuming that the, the stem of the brain is what controls the breathing. And if a person is not able to breathe independently, he's not considered alive. The whole thing is a Baba Maise. The whole breathing is just an Asmachta, and you have to have some other definition. And the Tanoim didn't know anything about the stem of the brain. You have to give a definition of life and death that the Tanoim were aware of. You can't give a definition that they never heard of. In our generation, you can make such a definition. These are the times I never had. So if you study all the Gemaras, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein has a truth about this also. If you study all the Gemaras, you see the definition of life and death is blood circulation because the blood circulates and supplies the oxygen to all the different cells and keeps them all alive. And this is based on the Pasuk and Chumash. Somehow the world of medicine didn't realize this till uh, recently, but it's a Pasuk and Chumash, Ki Adam Hu Anefesh that the blood circulation keeps all the people and all the animals alive. So years ago, there was a big dispute in America if a person had a stroke and he's paralyzed on the left side of his body, can he still fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin if he puts the tefillin on the dead arm? So Moshe Feinstein says, absolutely yes. How does he know? Because his father had a stroke. His father was uh, misnagged, and he slept in suke on Shmini Atzeres, even though he was freezing. And his father got a stroke because of that, and then he died. Ultimately, he died because of that. So I would think the moral of the story is that you should not sleep in the sukkah when it's freezing. So Moshe would be machmer. When it was freezing, he would sleep in the sukkah because his father was Moshe Nefesh. But he would tell his children and grandchildren they shouldn't sleep in the sukkah, but he was Moshe Nefesh. I would have thought, the reverse. The moral of the story is when it's freezing, you don't sit in the sukkah. Anyway, so his father had a stroke, and his father continued to wear tefillin on his left arm even after he had the stroke. So he said, that's the din, because that's what my father did. My father was a big tambahok. Where did the father get it from? So Moshe Feinstein shows it's a gemara in Bechoris. That's that part of Bechoris that nobody ever, only the daf Yomi people read every page. But the uh, yeshiva guys never learn that daf. The gemara talks about what's a balmum. So the gemara has gory... Uh, details about uh, what's considered a mum, what's not. So the Gemara says, if the blood is no longer circulating to a certain part of the body, 
in an irreversible fashion. If you just put a tourniquet for a minute and then you take it off, that's reversible. But if the blood is circulation stopped and it's not reversible, then that organ is considered dead. So Moshe Feinstein said that's a definition of life and death in an organ, and the Pashta says that's a definition of life and death in the whole organism. When the whole circulatory system collapses, so then Rav Moshe thinks that uh, life and death depends on the vital organs. So that's a question. All the vital organs, some of the vital organs, and the majority of the vital organs, how many vital organs are there? So that's, uh, that's all has to be negotiated. But uh, when the blood is no longer circulating to the vital organs, so then the person is considered dead. And then you have to work out the details. All the vital organs, or either the vital organs, or one of the vital organs is dead. But uh, it really shouldn't be. There's a, a scholar, a British scholar, who's about to publish an essay where he points out that those who did subscribe to the brain death uh, theory, that one is brain dead, is considered uh, dead, and is no longer a mitzvah to extend his life. So part of the definition of brain death is that the, per- the body, the person is not moving at all. Now they have a different definition of brain death. And he quotes this from, from some head of some uh, medical organization in America, the brain death today, when they, when they want to take an organ from a person who's brain dead, so sometimes when the doctors would be doing the surgery, taking out the organ, the patient would start waving his arms because he's cutting up his chest to take out his lungs, to take out his kishkes, taking things out. So they would, so they would wave their hands into the surgeon's face. So they inject some chemical into the person's blood system that he should not be able to wave himself. So this was always those who subscribed to brain death. I never thought it was correct, but those who subscribed to brain death always quoted Ramosha Feinstein that uh, it has to first be that there's no movement, the body is not moving at all. Over here the person is still moving, so it's a different definition of brain death today. So this uh, British, British scholar points out that even the Rabbanim who subscribed to brain death, but the word brain death means a different thing today. Years ago, 40 years ago, brain death meant a different thing, that there's a flat EKG, but the body was functioning like before, just there's no brain activity. So that, no one ever held that that's considered uh, dead. Brain death means that the stem of the brain is not enabling the body to, uh, to breathe anymore. But now it's, uh, now it's totally a mistake. Now you can't, you can't even rely on brain death now. I am delighted and honored to give this lecture to commemorate the 18th yort site of Dr. Lawrence Resnick, Yaakov Libor ben Gamliel Leib, an extraordinary man known as the Rebbe's doctor. I did not have the opportunity, this chus, to know Dr. Resnick personally, but I do, however, know his wife, Molly, uh, whom I first met at the National Jewish Retreat of Chabad a number of years ago. She is an extraordinary woman. Uh, All are enamored by her talent uh, and awed by her life story, which inspires thousands. I also have the opportunity to know one of his children, Elliot, whose works, whose writings, articles, books, and his impact on the media has had very positive impact globally. I am actually speaking about Dr. Resnick today, a man who had extraordinary research in the world of cardiovascular medicine. Uh, He trained and taught and practiced at our country's greatest institutions, at Harvard, at Cornell, uh, and much of his work was devoted to cardiovascular disease. Uh, Here you see some articles uh, from some of the greatest um, research journals of the world relating to hypertension. You have articles on hypertension and cardiovascular disease specifically. And in that vein, or if you will, in that artery, uh, we are going to be talking about cardiovascular disease in the Jewish tradition, in the Torah and in rabbinic literature and in response literature. We will be talking specifically about the heart. 
Uh, and this presentation I designed specifically for this yort site in honor of Dr. Resnick to talk about these kinds of issues. We have a slide here uh, with a phrase that we say multiple times a day from the Shema prayer. Ve'ahavta es Hashem elokecha bechol levavcha. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart. Although technically levavcha is plural, not singular. So it refers to more than one heart. What could that possibly be referring to? So the rabbis have said it refers to your Yetzer Hatov and your Yetzer Hara, your good inclination and your evil inclination. With both of those, you should worship the Lord uh, your God. But for this presentation, I shall say that one of the hearts refers to the metaphysical or metaphorical heart, and one refers to the anatomical heart. It is that heart which we will be addressing today, both in the Torah and in rabbinic literature subsequently. And here you have a magnificent illustration, which is actually a micrography of a pasuk, a phrase from Proverbs that talks about the heart and creates the anatomical illustration of the heart, including the four chambers and the great vessels. We begin with the Torah itself, with a story that you are all familiar with, but with an angle and approach which you may not be so familiar with. And that is the story of Jacob finding out for the first time that his son Joseph is actually alive. He long thought his son Joseph, his favorite son Joseph, to be dead. And lo and behold, his children come to him and inform him for the first time that his son is actually alive. And the Torah teaches us, His sons came to Eretz Canaan, to their father Jacob, and they informed him that Yosef was indeed alive. And what, how did Yosef respond? So the Torah tells us, Something happened to his heart. And uh, he may have passed out, he may have fainted. And then what does it say later on? And they, and they, uh, they rushed to him and they immediately spoke to him. And then at the end of the sentence, it says, And the Ruach of Yaakov was restored. Now, most of us learn as children, which is based on Rashi and based on the Medrash, that the prophecy, ability of prophecy of Jacob was lost when he believed that his son Joseph had died, Yosef had died. And when he found out that Yosef was actually still alive, his, uh, his, his spirit, his Ruach of prophecy was restored. But the Ramban actually interprets this in a physiological fashion, talking about the actual anatomical heart and the physiological heart. And he explains that what happened in this scenario is that he was so frightened or scared or surprised that his son, whom he thought long dead, was actually alive, that his heart expanded and the innate heat at that time, which was thought to be the heat which preserved the body, dissipated, and it caused Yaakov to faint, to pass out. The term vayafoglibo means his heart fainted or his heart ceased or stopped. So how does he explain vatechi ruach Yaakov? Not in the sense of prophecy, but he explains it in a concrete, physiological fashion. The, the ruach means his breath, vatechi ruach Yaakov. He had passed out and it looked as if he were actually dead, but his breathing, his breath, was actually restored. Also in the Torah, we have another discussion of the heart. And that discussion refers to Paro in Egypt. And we are all familiar with the fact that God hardened the heart of Paro. And many people interpret that in a metaphorical sense. But there is at least one person, actually a number of others, David Macht, who is a physician and graduate of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and, uh, and you see here on your slide that uh, he wrote a paper to graduate uh, in his fourth year of medical school from Johns Hopkins on Moses Maimonides on the Rambam. And at that time, it was the 800th anniversary of the birth of the Rambam. And in that honor, he wrote a, a paper which was published in the Johns Hopkins uh, Bulletin in 1906. And he wrote an entire work on the heart and blood in the Bible. Uh, and, and in there, he discusses a different interpretation, an anatomical or physiological interpretation about what had occurred to Paro. 
Uh, it says, Vayichazek lev paro, paro's heart was hardened, and kaved lev paro, paro's heart was heavy. Uh, so he actually says that perhaps he had hypertrophy of the heart, a term that Dr. Resnick would be well familiar with, which meant that his heart was hardened, his heart was heavier, physically heavier, uh, because, because of the hardening of the heart. And what caused the hardening of the heart? Uh, that was atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. Hence the expression by Chazek Lev Paro, his heart hardened with the calcium of coronary artery disease. Kaved Lev Paro, his heart was heavy because it was actually enlarged because of the disease that he had. And in fact, uh, there are physicians, uh, there was a physician back in 1929, Lord Moynihan, who was actually the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in England, who gave a talk exactly on this topic, the anatomical aspects of the heart of Paro. And in fact, they had at that time the very corpses, the very embalmed mummies of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. He actually believed that the pharaoh that they had, that they were, they were dissecting, they were looking at, was actually the pharaoh of the times of Moses. Uh, and they showed slides from the pathology of those mummies and slides from pathology of contemporary people, and they found out, uh, or they, they demonstrated that in fact, they both shared an interesting commonality. They both suffered from coronary artery disease. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what in fact uh, he believed. And he writes, mental changes went with the rigid arterial system. There was a narrowness and rigidity of outlook and a loss of enthusiasm. Uh, and he continues, uh, this is what it means, and the Lord hardened the heart of Paro. Uh, and, uh, and he explains that this is a testimony to the truth of the Old Testament. Here you have actual depictions, imaging, uh, of ancient Egyptian pharaohs. For those radiologists amongst you, uh, you will see on the right-hand side, uh, calcifications in the femoral arteries, and on the left-hand side, you'll actually see an image of the heart itself from ancient Egyptian mummies with calcification inside the coronary artery vessels. As we move forward into the 17th century, we find a fascinating halachic debate about the heart, but it was actually the heart of an animal, not the heart of a human being, and the case was as follows. In those days, many people did their own slaughtering of the animals that they ate, of the chickens that they ate, and sometimes they found anatomical abnormalities and they had to determine whether the animal was kosher to eat or not based on the anatomical abnormality if they were a trefa. In this particular case, a woman shechted or slaughtered the chicken. She opened up the chicken in order to prepare it for the meal, and she found that the chicken was missing a heart. So she was concerned, if the chicken is missing a heart, perhaps the chicken is a trefa, perhaps I'm not allowed to eat the chicken. So she went to one of the great sages of that time, the Chacham Tzvi, or Tzvi Ashkenazi, and the Chacham Tzvi determined that this chicken was absolutely kosher. On what basis? On the basis that there's no way this chicken could have survived and looked healthy and been healthy prior to this point and not had a heart. He asked the woman, do you have a cat in the house? And she said, yes, I do, I have a cat in the house. So he said, perhaps the cat ate the heart. And that explains why you did not see the heart upon your initial inspection. Uh, what is fascinating is that this responsum reverberated in rabbinic literature for many hundreds of years. Uh, the Chacham Tzvi uh, discussed extensively his understanding of the anatomy and the physiology and the halachic significance of the heart in that particular responsum. And he even said that if two witnesses come and say they did not see a heart in the chicken, these witnesses are not to be believed because there is no way this chicken could have lived without a heart. Uh, that particular aspect of his responsum and a number of others generated discussion amongst many great rabbinic figures in his time period. The Chacham Tzvi's tshuva is resuscitated, if you will, uh, hundreds of years later in the topic of brain death and the determination of death in the late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, we will discuss that chapter uh, later on in our discussion. It is interesting that while the Chacham Tzvi lived after William Harvey, 
who, dis who discovered the very circulation of the blood. He was not aware of the writings of William Harvey. However, there are those who wrote later who took issue with some of the discussions of the Chacham Tzvi, who were aware of William Harvey's uh, findings and the circulation of the blood, uh, and in addition, uh, discussed the matter, matter further from an anatomical and physiological perspective. And one of those people is Rav Yonason Eibeshitz. Later, uh, the uh, Jonas and Ibschitz would be engaged in a major battle with the son of the Chacham Tzvi, Rav Yaakov Emden, and those who know about the history, Jewish history of this period are well familiar with the so-called emden Ibschitz controversy. In this particular halachic discussion, Rav Ibschitz does something quite unique. In discussing the heartless chicken case of the Chacham Tzvi, in discussing the heart, the physiology of the heart, which is the topic of our discussion, he decides to send a question to the medical school, to the local medical school, to address the, the anatomy and the physiology of the heart. And his question is as follows. He writes to the University of Halle in Germany, is it possible for a chicken or an animal to survive without a heart? Is it possible perhaps that there is another organ that may not look like the heart, but could function equivalent or similar to the heart, such that the animal would look healthy, even in the absence of a heart. Uh, I actually took uh, the opportunity to send an inquiry to the University of Halle in Germany uh, a few years back and to ask if they had any record of this inquiry of Jovionis and Ibeschitz. And you have before you uh, the actual record in the archives of the University of Halle of this question that Jovionis and Ibeschitz asked. The responsum was a, it is called a responsum by the university, uh, and in that responsum they detail extensively a, uh, the anatomy of the heart, the physiology of the heart, and they do actually agree with Rav Yonas and Ibeschitz that it is possible for an animal to live without an anatomically looking heart, but at the same time something that functions equivalent to the, uh, to the function of the heart. Moving later in history, we find the expression of halachic issues relating to the function of the heart in the following fascinating halachic dilemma. It became possible at some point in history, and now it's an integral part of contemporary medicine, to resuscitate someone whose heart has stopped, what we know as CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The first halachic authorities who lived at the time that CPR was possible uh, entertained the following fascinating uh, halachic question. We know that if someone dies and they are married, the marriage is dissolved and the woman is, can remarry. The question was asked, if someone sustained a cardiac arrest with, with what we call asystole or flatline and is considered clinically dead and then returns to life, do they now have to remarry the woman that they were married to before because the death dissolved the marital bond. And this same exact question was actually addressed in another clinical scenario, focusing again on the heart and the physiology of the, of the heart. Cardiac surgery was very difficult to perform in the early stages of history, even in the modern era when we had anesthesia and we had antisepsis. Uh, it was difficult to operate on the heart because when you're operating on the heart, the heart was still beating. You can't operate on a beating heart, it's very difficult. So initially, in cardiothoracic uh, procedures, they would literally immerse the body in cold temperatures to slow down the heart, and the heart would continue to beat, albeit for a very, at a very, very slow pace. And this allowed cardiothoracic surgeons to operate on the heart. But in the mid 20th century, the scientists devised what was called cardiopulmonary bypass, and in cardiopulmonary bypass, they would literally divert the circulation uh, before the heart and restore it to the body after the heart. And the heart would be completely lifeless without blood supply uh, and without circulation during the course of cardiothoracic surgery. This enabled the surgeons to perform much more complex operations. But again, the same problem arose. If you're disconnecting the circulation from the heart, and the heart is not beating for a prolonged period of time, does halacha consider this person lifeless? Do they consider this person to have died? 
so there are many complex questions uh, surrounding this. Uh, but here again, the question was asked, uh, does he have to remarry his wife after he returns home, hopefully after a successful cardiothoracic surgery? Uh, so the answer to both of these questions was the no, he does not, a uh, patient does not, because death by definition is irreversible. And while it is true that the heart stops for a particular period of time, the person is not considered halakhically dead, because after all, he returns to life, and death by definition is irreversible. Now speaking of irreversible, that brings us to our next fascinating halakhic chapter related to the heart. And that is the introduction of new criteria of death. In all of history, it is the heart which determined whether one was alive or one was dead. Did one have a beating heart or not? There are many ways uh, that this was determined. Checking the pulse, checking the heart. Uh, breathing also was associated with that determination. Sometimes they'd put a feather over the nose to see if the feather would rise. In the 1960s, uh, there was an article which appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association called A Definition of Irreversible Coma, the very first article um, developing a new definition, which has now been accepted in modern medicine, and that, that is an alternate definition of death. Not that the heart has died, but only the brain has died, uh, and the heart can continue to beat. And the scenario where one finds this is a tragic uh, situation if someone sustains major head trauma, an EMS comes to the scene, puts them on a respirator, and performs uh, resuscitation and brings them back to the hospital. In many cases of head trauma, the brain can sustain such major trauma that the brain itself stops to function almost entirely. Yet, if oxygen is being supplied to the heart, the heart can continue to beat. In this particular scenario, the, this paper called A Definition of Irreversible Coma defined these patients as being legally dead because their brains were no longer functional. And once the brain is non-functional, they declare this an alternate form of death. This question is a major, major halachic question, one of the major halachic debates in the uh, end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. Uh, there is still no consensus. Many rabbinic authorities do not accept brain death to be considered halachic death, uh, while others do accept the criteria of halachic death. This is a, uh, a number of, of uh, entire books that have been devoted to this very complex uh, legal um, topic. Just to share with you one major source uh, which has been discussed around this topic. Uh, it's a source that comes from the Talmud Yoma, Tanura Banan Ad Hechen Hubodek. And here the context is, if a building collapses on, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, is one allowed to uncover the rubble, which is generally prohibited on Sabbath, uh, in order to save a life? So obviously, to save a life, one can violate the Sabbath. That, that is something that, uh, that's an integral, inherent part of the practice of medicine. But once you determine that the individual is no longer alive, then you no longer have license to violate the Shabbos. So that's exactly the context of this Talmudic passage. How far do you check in order to determine that the patient's still alive? Ad chotmo, you check until the nostrils, until the nose. Vyesh omrim ad libo. Some say you check until the heart. Uh, so the question here, uh, which contemporary authorities have been, have been dealing with, is does this give us an insight into the determination of death today where, where brain death could be considered an alternate form of death? Uh, some say uh, that, that uh, the breathing is simply a, ref a reflection of the heartbeat, uh, but others, others say that there is significance to the breathing alone, and the breathing which is controlled by the brain uh, malfunctions in a situation of brain death. That is the very definition of brain death. Someone has no independent respiration. Uh, so so uh, people look to this passage to discuss the contemporary uh, issue of whether halacha considers brain death to be halachic death or not. There is a case in the annals of medical halachic history relating to the heart, which is perhaps one of the most fascinating and complex cases of all of medical halachic literature. Uh, and that is the case of the conjoined twins, or so-called Siamese twins, of an Orthodox Jewish couple who shared a heart. 
uh, according to the physicians, there was no way these twins could survive in the absence of operative intervention. With operative intervention, only one twin would be able to survive. The surgeon at that time on the case at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was C. Everett Koop, who later went on to become a Surgeon General of the United States. It was an Orthodox Jewish family, and they asked the greatest rabbinic sage at that time, Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, if it would be halachically permissible to perform the operation. Would it be considered saving one twin, or would it be considered murdering the other twin? This was one of the more complex cases in all of medical halachic literature. And to share with you just one insight of this very complex case, Rav Moshe Feinstein kept asking C. Everett Koop the following question. He said, is one twin considered primary and the other twin considered secondary? And C. Everett Koop said, based on the physiology of the circulation, which is the focus of our presentation, the heart, it was a six-chambered heart, predominantly belongs, if you will, in the body cavity of one of the twins, and the other twin is really considered a secondary twin uh, and really detracting the circulation of the other one. Uh, and this was something which Moshe Feinstein asked repeatedly just to confirm this information, that one was indeed primary and one was indeed secondary. Why was this so essential to him? Because one is not allowed to sacrifice the life of someone else. But he considered the secondary twin to be a rodef, someone who is pursuing the life of the other. Uh, and uh, leaving aside the, the halachic intricacies of this case, Rav Moshe Feinstein ultimately decided that the surgery was permitted to perform. C. Everett Koop did perform the surgery uh, and, and sacrificed the life of the secondary twin in order to preserve the life of the primary twin. Many years later, C. Everett Koop went to the Chabad of Dartmouth to recall this case and share his insights about this case. Uh, and famously, uh, he was a very religious man himself, C. Everett Koop, and he was concerned about what his religion said about the permissibility and about the legality of this case. Would he be, uh, would he be uh, led out of the operating room in handcuffs uh, after having performed a possible murder? Uh, so he dealt with, with all these issues, but he famously said, we are not operating on these babies until a man in the Lower East Side makes his decision. And that man, of course, uh, was the great of Moshe uh, Feinstein Zatzal, who rendered his decision according to Halacha. Continuing on our theme of fascinating cases in the world of Halacha that deal exclusively with the heart, this is a very challenging case. Today it is now possible to insert automatic defibrillators into the heart that will give a shock to the heart to resuscitate. So we all know about CPR, we all know about delivering shocks. It used to be you could only deliver the shock outside the body with the, with the specific equipment. Now you can insert an automatic defibrillator which will deliver a shock if the heart starts to beat inappropriately. What if someone wants to shut off that defibrillator? What if someone says, I really am not interested in being resuscitated. I'd prefer if you shut off the defibrillator, remove the defibrillator. I don't, I don't want to be resuscitated if my heart stops. Is one halachically permitted to do such a thing? This is a debate amongst great contemporary authorities. There's one rabbinic authority who main, maintained, uh, Rebel Yoshev, that in fact the defibrillator is considered an integral part of the individual. And once it's an integral part of the individual, one cannot stop it, one, it cannot be ceased. One would need to have the defibrillator continue to do its job, irrespective of the person's wishes. Others, however, maintain, including Rav Asher Weiss, Shlita, that it is possible to deactivate the defibrillator. It's an external device. You are not stopping anything at this time. It's possible that it may never need to be used. Uh, and, and because of the, this factor and other factors, it may be possible to deactivate the defibrillator if the person wishes so. Continuing along the theme of the heart, we have the pasuk, the phrase from Yechezkel, from the prophet, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit into you. 
Vahasirosius Levo Evan, I will remove the heart of stone, Mibsarchem, from your body, Vinasati Lochem Lev Chadash, and I will give you a new heart. So some have turned to this Pasuk, to this phrase, and said, This is heralding what we now know to be as heart transplantation. And we talked about in the case of Paro, that he had the, the heart of the hardened heart, the Leva Evan, if you will. Now in the 20, 20th and 21st century, we can remove that heart and replace it with another heart. This presents major fascinating halachic issues, both for donors of the heart. Donation obviously takes place after death. Is it halachically permissible to donate? Donation takes place largely from, from those who are defined as brain dead, which is the topic we just talked about a moment ago. In order to serve as an organ donor in Jewish law, one has to define brain death as halachic death. And as we said, this remains a major debate with poskim rabbinic authorities accepting brain death and allowing organ transplantation, while on the other hand, uh, those who don't accept the brain death criteria and consequently would not allow for, for donation. The artificial heart is even more recent in its development. And, uh, and now, while the artificial heart uh, initially was just a temporizing measure, uh, now artificial hearts are being designed to be a permanent treatment for those who suffer from severe heart disease. It also presents interesting dilemmas. One fascinating, challenging dilemma with which Rabbi Jason Weiner of Cedar sinai raised in a case that he had is a patient who received an artificial heart, and the artificial heart had batteries that were continuing to function, but the person's other organs had, in essence, all stopped functioning. But the heart was continuing to beat. If you define life as the beat of the heart, that artificial heart could continue to beat for years and years and years, even if the body is decomposing around it. The question is, in such a scenario, how do you define death? Can you turn off that heart? Do you define death now as, as loss, loss of function to the brain, even if you wouldn't normally define death as loss of function to the brain? So these are fascinating and complex issues related to the heart in our final case. Uh, just to highlight uh, some of the issues relating to the cardiovascular disease, which was the specialty of Dr. Resnick. And the most recent case is the transplantation of a pig heart into a human being. And I suspect many of you have heard of this case, familiar with this case. Just a few months ago, a human being received a transplantation of a pig heart. What are the halachic issues here? Aside from the standard issues of transplantation, is it permissible to receive an organ from an animal which is treif? The animal, the pig is obviously a non-kosher animal. Uh, the, uh, the most non-kosher animal from the perspective of the non-Jewish world is the pig. Can one have a pig organ inserted into the human being? In fact, organs or extracts from pigs have been inserted into human beings for decades. This is not a new phenomenon. Here you have uh, in your, uh, presented before you insulin, which is called, called uh, porcine insulin, which is derived from pigs. And human beings used to use porcine insulin uh, for, for decades. And valves of the heart, while the entire heart was not derivative of the pig, valves have been translated, tra transplanted both from cows and pigs. Porcine and bovine valves have been translated for decades. Does this present a halachic issue? In short, the prohibition against pig is only ingesting pig orally. Injecting extract of pig and porcine insulin, inserting porcine valves uh, into the body, is not considered a specific violation of the prohibition of ingesting or orally ingesting uh, the pig. The same is true, of course, for the entire heart of the pig. If the entire heart would be transplanted, this would not uh, be considered a halachic violation of, uh, of ingesting something which is treif. And in fact, the Talmud specifically discusses the relationship of pigs to human beings. You may ask, why is it specifically the pig that has to be transplanted in the human being? Aren't there other animals which are equivalent? So very interestingly, the Talmud says thousands of years ago, Ika Musna Bechazir, Rabbi Yehuda said, if there's a plague amongst the pigs, um, the Jews should be concerned. The Jews should fast. So they asked him, why should the Jews fast if there's a plague amongst the pigs? Are you concerned about plague affecting one species, affecting all species, and being transported over from animal to human, 
which is something that uh, we are living with with the COVID-19 virus, also being uh, transported from animal to human. So he said, I'm not concerned in general about that, but he said pigs are different because the pig anatomically uh, is similar to the human being. And since they are similar to the human being, I'm concerned about disease transmission, which may be why that it happens to be the pig which is used for organ transplantation today. Be that as it may, we've had an opportunity uh, to discuss uh, some chapters in history dating back from the Torah itself through the 17th, 18th century up to the very current 21st century, all with one theme. And that is the theme that Dr. Lawrence Resnick led his entire life by, and that's cardiovascular disease, helping the world uh, to be healthier in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Uh, I conclude with another th themed concept about the heart as we approach the holiday of Shavuos, uh, when the people were standing under Har Sinai and, uh, and Hashem held the mountain over them to accept the Torah, uh, the Chazal tell us that at that stage they were ki'ish echad, belev echad. They were united as one human being with one heart. And I hope our presentation about the heart in memory of Dr. Resnick should be an honor for him. And, uh, and God willing, in, in our receiving the Torah in this upcoming Shuas, we should all stand united together. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope this is a proper tribute to the memory of Yaakov Libor Ben Gamliel Leib. <laughs>